Hello and welcome to the After Sermon Podcast. And I have with me a stellar team of people. You know them because they've been, all three of them have been with us over the last three parts of our epic series on our favorite characters in the Bible. So he's the man, the myth, the legend. It's Michael Godfrey. Hello, everyone. It's good to be back. Good to have you here as well. We've got Dr. MD over in my left-hand corner, Mr. Mitchell Sonta. <laughs> It should be um, MS. MS. <laughs> Ms. No, what? Dr. MD, that's Ms. interesting. Santa? MS. For Mitchell Is Santa. that like saying doctor, doctor? <laughs> My lecturer is a doctor, doctor. Cool. Head of seminary, doctor, doctor, Wendy Jackson. Little shout out there. <laughs> <laughs> and look. Shout out to Wendy Jackson, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and look, ladies... Come on, get onto this. Boys, hide, hide your ladies, because we have a triple threat in the room. He packs wheat bicks. Whoa. He is yeah. an expert groundsman keeper. And he somehow finds time to study theology. It's Jesse Marks. Always a pleasure, Chris. Always a pleasure. We are on our third part of this series. And so far, we've shared our top five characters in the Bible. Now, we're not going to give a full recap of all five. But last episode, Mitchell and I both shared our number one. So my number one was the prophet Jeremiah, and Mitchell's was King Nebuchadnezzar. And if you'd like to learn more about why it was we chose these characters as our number one picks from all the characters in the Bible, we picked these ones you're going to have to go and listen to our last episode. So the link will be down in the description below and you can listen back. And we kind of give a detailed um, kind of recap of the person's life, but we don't just give exposition. We're also sharing with you through each step of their life journey, what it is that resonates with us and practical things that you can apply to your life as well. So it's really actually, you get to learn about the Bible. You get to learn, um, more, a bit more about us and you get to learn practical things that you can apply to our lives. So really I think these are some of the best episodes we've ever made. Like three birds, one stone there. We got yet another triple threat. This podcast is a triple threat and it's part three. The number three keeps coming up. It's the Trinity of podcasts. So, <laughs> <laughs> so today we have Mitchell and Jesse. No, sorry, Michael and Jesse, my bad. Michael and Jesse sharing with us who their number one picks are. And so what I think we'll do is start off with you, Michael. Take us through your number one pick. Uh, sure. Okay. Well, uh, as you know, we've, we've all covered some pretty, some pretty big personalities. I think, I think for me, and you can, you can go think back to episode one, I think for me, uh, I've had a range of, big famous personalities and those um, maybe more obscure or slightly less known for my number one pick. Uh, yeah, can you, before you do that, can you remind us who your first four were or your, sure. as in like just, just their names? Yeah, sure. So number five was David. Number four, Zacchaeus. Number three, Peter. Number two, the apostle Paul. And my number one pick, uh, I, I could not, it's, it's um, perhaps the most famous character in the whole Bible. I could not, uh, I could not choose anyone else. It's Jesus Christ himself. Ah, oh, this guy. <laughs> now, now bear with me. The, um, first of Jesse, all, the rule. Jesse, how are you going to follow this, man? <laughs> <laughs> I can't. He's, he's set the bar too high. I, I should just leave. The, I should just leave now. <laughs> now it's now up here. The rules, first of all, the rules never me to choose Jesus. Um, secondly, I'm going to argue that I couldn't not. I couldn't not. Um, let, me, let me start by telling you a bit of a story. Uh, the other day I was scrolling through memes, uh, as, as you do in your spare time. I don't know if you do that. That's something that I do when I feel like wasting time. Uh, and I saw this, this meme. It was, a, it was an image. It was a status update. This person, you might have seen it. Um, their status update was... Reading the Bible and my favorite character just died. Sucks for real. And then, and then um, there was like a, um, it was like a retweet, uh, same guy. They quoted themselves and they're like, oh my goodness, they just brought him back. 
<laughs> bring back. Um, you can't not bring back the main character of the Bible. You know, it, it's like, um, it, it, it would be like, um, I'm trying to, I, I was going to give an example, but I don't want to give out any, put out any spoilers in this, <laughs> in the podcast. Um, you know, it would, it would be like, I don't know, having the Terminator without the Terminator. Um, it, it, you can insert any movie there, but it's, it's the main character. It's who the whole Bible is about. Um, and Jesus is easily the most influential character in the whole Bible. Mm. See, it's funny, you've got the Old Testament and Jesus is definitely mentioned, but not by name. You'll never find the, the word Jesus in the Old Testament. And yet the Old Testament is all about Jesus. Um, you think about the creation of the world, you think about the Ten Commandments, you think about, um, you think about the Jewish sacrificial system, the Passover, you think about so many different aspects and elements, think about the sanctuary. Um, everything points towards Jesus. The, the Jews themselves um, still to this day are looking forward to this coming Messiah. The New Testament is all about Jesus too. The Gospels are all about Jesus' life, the early church. Um, and, and the final book in the Bible is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The whole Bible is all about Jesus. Um, and even further than that, Jesus is not merely the most influential character in the whole Bible, as if that weren't enough. He's also one of the most, if not the most influential person of all time. Mm. You can look at different lists. People are talking about the most influential people in history, and Jesus regularly tops that list. Um, there are lots of examples that I could give. I'm going to give this one really random example. Have, have, have you heard, has anyone heard of the, the wiki game? Who's heard of the wiki game? Yeah. Yeah. So you've got this game. Um, basically what you have to do is they give you a random article and another random article. You start at the first random article and you have to look through the article for the hyperlinks you have to click through the links until you get to the other article. And it's not something simple like get from red to green. It's something completely random. Like it might be, um, um, I don't know, it might, be, it might be something like get from the French Revolution to cryogenics or something completely random, completely like, I don't know, it's crazy. Um, well, the wiki game has a lot of different variations. One variation of the wiki game is don't use the United States because the United States is so prevalent. It's just too easy for you to click to the United States and then you've just got access to everything. I don't know, pretty much everything. You can just use them as like a stepping stone. Um, another variation of the wiki game is called five clicks to Jesus. And the reason, the reason that it's so crazy is that you can start at any random article and within five clicks, you can get to the article about Jesus. This is how influential Jesus is in our society, in our culture, in the whole world. They even made a game about him called Five Clicks to Jesus. That's, that's just crazy to me. Like, he's just the most influential guy ever. Now that I've talked about his influence, I want to talk about why Jesus is my favorite character in the Bible. Uh, I've got four points. Number one, um, Jesus is attractive. Um, you think about Jesus' personality, it's kind. It's selfless. Jesus is someone that cares about people. He's not selfish. He's not self-seeking. Uh, I was wondering if one of you could look up John chapter 12, verse 32. Let me get something that I should have had in front of me this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go right ahead. Um, Chris, maybe you could get up John chapter 12, verse 32 for us. John 12, 32. Reading from the ESV, it says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Awesome. So Jesus is speaking and he's saying, I'm, I'm going to draw all people to myself. Um, the way that he does that is through his personality. The way that he does that is by investing in others, caring about others. Uh, Jesus is attractive. The second reason why Jesus is my favorite character in the Bible is because Jesus is humble. Um, you, you think about someone that has all of those traits um, someone that is preaching to crowds all the time. If it was anyone else, you'd think that that fame um, could go to their head, but it doesn't to Jesus. Uh, the, next, the next passage that I have is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. Maybe you guess you could look that one up. Jesus. 
And we could go to so many different places to talk about how Jesus was humble and how he was just like completely just not in it for himself. Um, but this is a really good passage that I like that just explains it really well. So. Cool. So Philippians 2, 5 through to 8. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Mm, awesome. So, um, you know, Jesus could have come to earth as a king because he is a king, but he didn't. He chose to come as he chose to come uh, in a manger in some unknown town. He, he chose to become, like, come as a servant and to serve other people rather than be served by people, even though he deserved to be served by people. Uh, he chose to eat with tax collectors and sinners instead of with the rich and the wealthy and the, you know, the famous. Um, and to top it all off, he chose to give up his life for people that didn't deserve it. Um, if you wanted a definition of what humility is, then that's a pretty good definition. Mm. Or at least that sounds like a definition to me of what humility is. So that's the second thing. Number three, Jesus is relatable. Jesus is relatable. You, you know, it's, <laughs> it's very hard for us to comprehend God and what God is like. But in the person of Jesus, I feel like we can somewhat relate. Um, the verse that I have for this one uh, is Isaiah 53 verses 2 to 5. I was wondering if Mitchell might be able to get this one. Yeah. Uh, Isaiah what? Sorry, 53? Oh, actually, um, actually, can you grab um, Hebrews 4.15? Hebrews 4.15 is better. Um, I'll, I'll talk about Isaiah while Mitchell's grabbing the other verse. So the reason that I, that I said that Jesus is relatable is because Jesus was tempted with all the same things that we're tempted with. You know, Jesus didn't come and, um, and, and have like this bubble around him so that nothing could touch him, nothing could affect him. You have stories like the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, um, but really his whole life, um, it, it talks about in Isaiah how he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So acquainted with it, I mean, he knew it. He knew what it was like. Jesus understands what it's like to experience pain, um, to be tempted by sin. He understands what it's like to be human. He's not some person that's completely beyond us and above us. Um, he humbled himself when he came to experience what we experience every day and so much more than we maybe ever will. Um, and for that reason, Jesus is relatable. Uh, and Mitchell's going to read this verse in Hebrews, which I think really like sums it up really well. I'm reading Hebrews 4.15. Um, yeah. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Yeah, cool. Uh, so I think that verse sums it up pretty clearly. I, I don't know about you. I think um, it, it says it really clearly. He's able I'm, to sympathize um, with our weaknesses. He was tempted as we are. And yet he's also the perfect role model because he never sinned. Um, you know, he went I'm thinking from, from that verse, sorry to cut you off. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, like the language is for we do not. And, and you think to yourself, well, it's like a, it's like an unnecessary, you know, I don't know. It's it just, it Double sounds like the language. It's, it's like the language. Why, why does he need to say it doesn't happen? Why can't he yeah. just say we do have a high priest who does this? I yeah. guess. Yeah. I'm thinking maybe the people were pretty used to high priests that weren't able to sympathize with them at all. Yeah, yeah. So it was, yeah, I guess it was kind of a, it was drawing a comparison, I guess, or, or reminding yeah. them that the example that was meant to be there for him wasn't, wasn't actually accurate. Hmm. It is interesting. Yeah, like you said, we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Um, and I really like what Mitchell just said. He summed it up really well. I guess maybe the high priest at the time when we're not, we're, like, we're unable to, to understand what people were going through. When you think about the Pharisees around, like at the time and, and the um, people kind of in the higher social classes, they would walk the streets and they would have no idea what it was like to be in poverty, like the poor people. But, but Jesus, 
Jesus didn't come and like, again, you know, Jesus didn't come to earth and, and act like a nobleman. He associated with the poor and with the hungry and with the needy and um, really put himself into their shoes and into their life. And that's why Jesus is relatable. And the final thing, the final reason why Jesus is my favorite character in the Bible is because Jesus is omnibenevolent. Who can tell me what omnibenevolent means? Chris, how about you? It's like all, all good or all loving. Yeah, like that. Exactly that. A plus for Chris. All good, all loving. That's exactly it. Yeah, um, if you think about relatable protagonists in books, you know, you want your protagonist to be relatable. You want your protagonist to be relatively attractive. Um, I think, I don't think there's a more attractive trait than being all loving. And um, Jesus was the ultimate expression of love. Uh, he preached relentlessly about loving your neighbor, about loving God and loving others. He showed us how to do that. He didn't just tell us to, you know, like <laughs> um, sometimes I'll, Sometimes I'll say to my students, do what I say and not what I do, you know, do this and do that and, you know, do something else. But um, I won't be the best role model sometimes. Uh, <laughs> Jesus was not like that. Jesus was the perfect role model because he didn't just tell people to be loving. He backed that up with his actions. He demonstrated what it means to be loving, what it means to be love. Mm. And, the final verse that I want to finish with is in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 to 39. Uh, and it says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, and I think that's really encouraging. Um, you, you look at Jesus demonstrating love throughout his whole life and then the ultimate expression of love in the cross. And then you read this passage talking about how nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Um, yeah. Mm. I, um, I think that's, that's really inspiring. Um, up, Jesus is my favorite character because he's attractive, humble, relatable, and all loving. Mm. Yeah, that's my number one. That is a great list. And like, I'm thinking to myself, where do you even go with that? Because <laughs> the topic of Jesus and who he is, is just so broad. And it's exactly like how John finishes his gospel by saying, there isn't enough parchment to write on about the things that Jesus did in his life, you know? And I think you've done a perfect summary of like four attributes that really resonate with you. And if, yeah, I were to think about Jesus, I'd be like, yeah, I, I think I'd probably end up with very similar things. Like those are all dead on, like his humility, his love, his relatability and attractivity, like mm. attractivity is not a word, but, um, and I'm thinking as well, probably I'd say a lot of our characters that we talked about five through to number two are probably, especially if they're Old Testament characters, are shadows or types of the ultimate fulfillment who is Jesus. Mm, um, I was, hmm. yeah. 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 So for our listeners at home, um, if you're unfamiliar with the, this idea, there's an idea in Christianity called typology um i might jesse i'll check it over to you do you want to explain to our listeners what typology is yeah for sure um so yeah basically throughout the old testament you have either uh things like sacrifices or even people that are sort of like uh, a little look forward a little peek into the future of what jesus would bring so like for example there's a story of abraham when uh, he has to take up his son to a mountain and uh, almost sacrifices him. And then God comes in and says, no, sacrifice the lamb instead. And what we get from that is a beautiful picture of what Jesus would do, uh, where he would be the sacrificial lamb. Uh, you have other instances of, uh, yeah, trying to think, like David, for example. Um, there's so many instances of Jesus being called the son of David or 
he's the the true king of Israel, and David is a type a type of king that Jesus would fulfill in that sense. And all throughout the Old Testament, whether it be characters or instances or stories, yeah, they just point forward to Jesus. You can see Jesus in those Old Testament stories and and things. Yeah, and even that verse we read in Hebrews shows that. So the high mm. priests who worked in the sacrificial system in the Old Testament were really just pointing forward to the greater high priest that we would have in Jesus. Mm. Um, so I just think that's I actually really love the fact that you picked Jesus. Cause I think probably, yeah, there was no written rule that said you couldn't say <laughs> Jesus or God. <laughs> the, like, the, the rest of us three, unless Jesse's got this as well, probably went, Oh, okay. You know, it's like a list by Jesus. Um, but I really like actually that you picked it because I feel like it does capture what all of our other Bible characters are really all about pointing mm. forward to Jesus. Um, now I'll hand it over to Mitchell and Jesse, if they have any other comments, I kind of don't really want to say much more because again, I'm like, <laughs> where do you start and end? Like you're going <laughs> to like so broad. So I've got two questions I want to ask you for the sake of our listeners afterwards, but yeah, Mitchell, Jesse, do you have any other like comments that are coming to your mind? Like particularly from what Michael's been saying. I think that's a really good point you raised about the relatability of Jesus. Like, the godly Old Testament just seemed, well, he's so grand and, and awesome and powerful. And Jesus is too. But yeah, you can, like, because he's a, he's a person, he's a human being, you can relate to Jesus. Um, so I, I thought that was a really good point. Yeah. Thanks. I liked how when you were starting, you were talking about he sort of came here and exposed himself. Like he wasn't, he didn't sort of distance himself from reality. Um, mm-hmm. and I guess, you know, I was trying to. I was trying to um, think of scenarios that I'd be in that would make me feel a similar way to how he must have felt. Um, and you know, the first scenario that came to my head was like, "Oh, I, I go to you know, some, some poor country and go to the, you know, the poor parts of that country, and you know, it's it's un- unclean, like unhygienic, um, there's sort of animals everywhere and that kind of stuff." But in reality, that's not it, because that's still my world. We're talking about mm. someone who's come from perfect. Mm. So in reality, it would be like me going to swim in a sewer. Like, mm. I don't think, I, don't, I think that would be a much closer, you know, you'd be, you'd be at least on the right track of getting a, a comparison. Um, but he, like he, you know, he didn't hate it. I don't think. Mm. He, there was a the benefit outweighed the negative, I guess. Mm. So, Michael, I've got a question for you because maybe a lot of our listeners have heard a lot about Jesus. You know, as you said, Jesus, everyone knows about Jesus pretty much, right? He's so pervasive. We all have a kind of perception of who Jesus is. So my question is, to the listener at home who might be thinking this, what would you respond? What makes Jesus unique or... in or why Jesus? So for example, you know, some view Jesus just as like some sort of great teacher perhaps, or maybe Jesus didn't even exist or what makes a Jesus different, let's say from the gods or or great teachers of other religious uh, traditions and belief systems. Why Jesus for you, Michael? And why do you think Jesus? Yeah. Why Jesus for everyone really? Okay, so um, good, very good question. Um, I, I'm going to answer it by using C.S. Lewis's liar, lunatic, and lord, um, his reasoning from mere Christianity. Uh, I think I think it's um, it really explains well why why this is from like you said. I mean, there are a lot of great teachers and um, you know, people that um, that others consider to be prophets uh, that, that that existed. I think we have a lot of evidence to suggest that Jesus existed. It's, it's not only the Bible. We have a lot of secular evidence as well to, to prove that Jesus was a person that existed in history. It's, I think it's funny that you can have a very small amount of evidence to, that, that Julius Caesar ex- existed and yet no one questions whether Julius Caesar existed. And yet we have so much evidence that Jesus existed and people still question it. 
I think maybe that's speaking volumes as to, um, I guess, why Jesus is so special and unique that people kind of do question it. Going back to liar, lunatic, and Lord, um, Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. And Jesus claimed to forgive sins. Uh, so for Jesus to claim that, C.S. Lewis argues that there's only really three three possibilities as, as to what Jesus is. First of all, he's just a straight up liar. You know, he, he claims to be God and to forgive sins and to be divine. He, he's straight up lying. He's, he's in his right mind and he's just, you know, he, he knows that he's deceiving people and he's just knowingly, just knowingly doing it. Um, and, and, and maybe backing it up with some miracles or fabrications or whatever you, you want to argue, but that's, that's one that's one option is that he was just a liar. Option two, option two is that he was just a lunatic, that he was just crazy. He was mad that he himself did not really know what he was talking about and um, whether or not he had any type of power or just really good public speaking skills. The fact of the matter is that he claimed he was God and he claimed to be able to do all of these things. He, he said that I, he said, I am that I am. Um, he, you know, he says, um, he um, says, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. You know, he says all these things um, for him to be going and saying all these things. Maybe he's mad. You know, maybe he's a lunatic. Um, option three is that he's Lord. Option three is that he actually is God. And that he came here and that he was exactly who he said he was. And he could do exactly what he said he could do. Uh, and those are your three options, really. You, you can't really just say that Jesus was a good moral teacher like so many others. You can't say that you could just put Jesus in that category with, with so many other people. He does stand out because of the claims that he makes. Um, it's really impossible for you to say that. Really, the only three conclusions that you can draw are that he was crazy, that he was evil, or that he was God. That's, that's what makes him unique. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and when you look at the evidence, like the the life of Jesus certainly does not emulate someone who's, you know, lost a few marbles. So you knock out lunatic. And when it comes to liar, you have to look at, I think almost the sheer movement that's created in his wake. This proves that like, because mm. in order to have that movement, Jesus would have had to have risen from the dead. And mm. I, uh, sorry, mm. just on that, on that point and then continue, Chris, um, yeah. I read something, um, about a psychologist who analyzed some of the stories and they were basically saying that for the sheer number of people that that were present at at the at one of the you know one of the events where Jesus was he performed a miracle or something for the sheer number of people to all simultaneously have seen it and then to say that they've seen it and everything it sort of it sort of breaks like the statistics of of, of what could be um, lunacy, like it's it's very hard to produce madness in that many people simultaneously. Mm. Um, yeah. Anyway, I mean, the, the, her statement was more clever than what I just said, but um, it was. I think I got the point across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So um, as I was saying, yeah. So you have the liar one doesn't make sense. Oh, sorry, the lunatic one doesn't make sense, and then uh, yeah. Uh, there's this great apologist, Frank Turek, and he says, I think William Lane Craig probably says this as well, that the resurrection is the authentication of Jesus' claims. That hmm. if Jesus hmm. truly is the son of God, he has the power over life and death and the power to resurrect himself. That's something only a divine being can do. And right. the evidence we have of the resurrection, we not only have the textual evidence in scripture, but we're like living in the evidence. The evidence is that the movement didn't die when Jesus died, that mm. three days later he rose and these disciples went and preached it to the whole world. And uh, Paul says in first Corinthians, he goes, look, over 500 people saw Jesus resurrected. Like this wasn't isolated. This was real. And let's say, you know, that's a publicly handed out letter. If no one had ever seen Jesus, post his death that would be so easy to disprove you just go no one's seen him and yet you have all these witnesses who write about it 
and people believe them for good reason because they believe that this testimony is authentic authentic and real and mm-hmm. so the resurrection proves that Jesus isn't a liar and so yeah you're stuck with he's a lord that's it um, and i think the the fact that so many christians were willing to be martyrs they were willing to go and and die for what they believed in i mean you wouldn't you wouldn't die for a lie you wouldn't die for something that was fabricated you know you wouldn't yeah. go that far that's right. Yeah, yeah, like when you lie, it's for, there's got to be some gain. There's got to be some personal gain. Like, I don't see much, much more, much other, many other reasons to lie except for personal gain because you're ripping everyone else off apart from yourself. So to lie and then think that lie is important enough to maintain to the point where you die, well, you're, you're losing any possibility of personal gain at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And, I'm just uh, just one thing that came to mind while we were talking was I think another thing that makes Jesus and Christianity so unique is that fact that Jesus, as um, both Michael, you and Mitchell were talking about, Jesus comes down to us. Mm. I cannot think of any other God who does that in all mm. of the ancient religions the gods are up, you know, in the mountains and the pantheons up on the, you know, up high in the sky and zero interaction. Um, Mm. In like pagan religions, God is usually like in nature and he's like one with nature. You can't personally connect with him. Like it's this nebulous, Mm. vague concept, really. He's not personal or relatable, like you said. Um, I guess guess when the Greek gods came down, it was more for their own personal gain. Yeah, they, they were yeah. close and personal, but not in a kosher way. Like, <laughs> just, yeah, Zeus, Zeus was not um, morally good at all. Um, and then you would say, oh, it's Zeus. I'm so happy to see him. That Zeus came to my house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, words no one no. ever said. <laughs> then you actually going to hide your wife and hide your kids. Yeah, actually. Yep, yes, that's do it. For, for sure. Um, and then you've got like buddhism and hinduism which really like they don't have a god buddhism doesn't hinduism does but the god like is just nothingness and the Mm. only way to reach him is to become one with him in nothingness and then you've got islam which has god but again god is very distant he um the concept of allah he doesn't come down he's not close and personal you can't have an intimate relationship you worship him and you submit to him just like we Christians do. But then we have that added element of a personal relationship with our God that is lacking in the Muslim faith. And so I think that's, we just have this incredible idea that no other religious belief does that God wants an intimate and personal relationship with you. And you even Mm. see that in the old Testament and new Testament idea of covenant that God enters into an agreement with his people and he says, I'm going to commit to you and I'm going to show love and grace. And even just as a quick aside, Jesus is unique because he provides for us uh, grace through faith or the idea that Jesus death covers all our sins and we contribute nothing to our own salvation. Mm. Every other religious tradition, you have to work for it. But Jesus is like that ultimate stamp of approval that says, if you accept Jesus, then you are saved. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to, isn't that awesome? You don't have to climb up to God, up in the mountains, up in the pantheon. Jesus comes down so that you can be with him. And that's that's just crazy. You know, uh, it just shows what an awesome God we serve. Yeah. Well, so great. Just to add on, yeah, what Chris is saying as well. A couple of years ago, I was studying uh, ancient history. and I was, One of the assignments was on sacrifices in the Greek world. And just looking at the different ways of viewing sacrifice within Christianity in the pagan world, it's astounding. Mm-hmm. Like you sacrifice in the pagan Greek world to appease the God, to get something from the God, to make sure the God doesn't come down and strike you or that you, you know, you have crops. I, like even in some senses, you sacrifice yourself, you sacrifice your children. And Christianity is the only religion where God is the sacrifice. Mm. Uh, he comes down and yeah, to save your children, to save, yeah, to save us. So I thought that's pretty cool as well. Yeah. 
Well, mm. look, we uh, usually save our appeals for the end, but I'm going to do a quick mini one before we go to Jesse, which is Michael has given such a beautiful picture of who God is and who Jesus is and what makes Jesus so unique and distinct from every other religious teacher or every other deity. Um, Jesus is unique and he's the only one that can save us. He says that he is the, the way, the truth and the life. And so to our listeners at home, if you've been impacted as you've listened through this, it's really simple. Salvation is so simple. It ju is just a surrendering to God. It is repenting of your sins, saying, God, I've done the wrong thing. And then accepting and embracing that sacrifice that Jesus gave for you. So Look, even if you want to quickly pause before we continue on with Jesse, take some time to pray, think about this, and give your life over to God. Like, this is why we do the podcast, so that people can hear about Jesus and make those decisions. So, yeah, I just implore you to think about that if you haven't already made that decision. All right, well, let's transition now into Jesse, your number one characters. Oh, <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> All right, Jesse, let's transition now into who is your number one Bible character. You gotta try and top Jesus. That's that's the that's the standard now that's been set. So good <laughs> well, I, I will try I will try my best, Chris, <laughs> but no promises. <clears throat> no, I, I can definitely not top. Uh wonderful job, Michael. Uh that was that was awesome. Very um, keen to hear us though, Jesse. <laughs> cool well actually it's kind of funny um if jesus is the main character of scripture i think technically my character is the second most uh at least to referred character in all of the bible <laughs> so <laughs> a little bit of a uh step down but it's all good um so yeah if you want to hear my top uh my other four go back and listen to the last one but yeah to reveal my number one it is none other than David himself. Hey. Good old, good old David. And and I think Chris made a prediction that David would be a number one. So there you go. All to Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got I, was, I had I had the natural advantage of living like two doors away from you. So like <laughs> we're able to have lots of conversations about like David and stuff for that year. <laughs> That does help. Yeah, true. I, that that would help. <clears throat> but yeah, I, I was thinking about David and I was like, okay, if David was living today and he was applying for a job, he would have one of the most impressive resumes that I think anyone could ever possibly imagine. Uh, this guy was just incredible. Okay, so a shepherd. So he's, he's he works with sheep. He's a musician. He's expert harp player. He was also a beautiful writer of poetry and psalms. Just, just to top it off, he's also a mighty warrior, a, a military strategist. And, you know, he's just a king as well. You know, just another thing to add onto the list. Uh, nothing too important. <laughs> just yeah, an incredible person. Like, how many things could you do in your life and be skilled at? But this is David. This is David. A uh, yeah, truly remarkable individual. Um, and blessed of God. And, you know, it makes sense that this remarkable man has a unsurprisingly remarkable story attached with him. And um, the books that he's found in the Bible, first and second Samuel and the story of his life is obviously one of my favorite stories in the entire Bible. I, I love those two books. Um, I think one of my other characters in those books as well. So yeah, just to give you a little brief summary for anyone out there who doesn't know uh, anything about David, like I said before, he starts off as a humble shepherd He's uh, the youngest in his family, the least, but he's called uh, and anointed to be the future king of the kingdom of Israel. But before he becomes king, he, uh, he has an interesting life. He actually has to live on the run with like a band of warrior friends called the mighty men in the Bible. And he's living in the wilderness. And the reason he's doing this is because the current king isn't too happy that he's going to be the future king. And so he's literally trying to pursue David to kill him. And so he's living this life on the, on the run in the wilderness with his, his uh, group of friends and uh, military mighty men around him. And you get that happens for a while. And then eventually you go down the story and he finally becomes king. Um, 
And when he does, he unites Israel as one nation and becomes arguably the greatest king uh, to rule over the nation. Although maybe with the accession of, uh, of Solomon, Unfortunately, that's not really saying too much because if you keep reading about the the, the kings that follow him, they're not, not they're not, <laughs> not, not high bar. <laughs> but uh, if you read the story of David, you realize, okay, no, nah, he's he's actually an amazing king. Solomon was only possible because of David, I think. Mm. Yes, yeah, mm. no, great for sure, great point. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very true. Uh, so yeah, there's many reasons to admire David. Um, he has many noble attributes, just to list a few, his courage in battle, you know, the classic facing the giant Goliath. One that I think is overlooked too, the fact that he seemingly had no hate or any feelings of malcontent towards Saul and his family. The guy mm-hmm. I referenced before, literally trying to kill David, the majority of, uh, of yeah, Saul's life, he was trying to kill David. And yet, Saul, uh, David has this almost kind of respect and reverence for Saul and definitely the position of Saul as king that God gave him this position. And I've always had the utmost respect for David in that, in that sense. I think that, yeah, it's very admirable. Um, and of course, uh, his main poetry, his faith in God, his wisdom and ruling. There's many reasons to, to be a fan of David. But I think if I had to narrow it down uh, to possibly one of the the, the, the best reasons that I personally admire David is his heart. Um, the heart of David is a recurring theme, even into the New Testament. Um, the Bible describes God, uh, David, as a man after God's own heart. And there's two times that this happens in the Bible. Both times God calls this uh, David a man after his own heart. If you want to look it up, it's in Samuel uh, chapter 13 and verse 14. And then in Acts, that's the second time where we hear this, that God calls David a man after his own heart. And I'm sure there's many reasons why David is referred to this. Uh, But, and I think I've already listed a few, but I think really at the heart of it is that God and David were on the same page. I I think they shared the same desires in many respects. They both had a deep love for their people. Uh, They both had a love of truth and justice and obedience to the law of God. And they both had a desire to know each other. Um, And I want to hone in on that a little bit. I I love David because of his deep desire to know God personally and to know God deeper. Um, I've got a a verse that maybe, Mitch, if you wouldn't mind looking this up. It's in the book of Psalms and Psalms chapter 61 and verse 1. If you wouldn't uh, mind looking that up. Yep. Um, Psalm 61 verse 1. Um, hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. Okay, is that it? <laughs> yep. Maybe read the uh, maybe read the next verse as well. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Um, I'll start from the, I'll start from verse one. It's short again. Um, cool. <laughs> hear, my, hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Hmm. Cool. I think I've actually got the wrong verse. So. Uh... <laughs> Never mind. Um, so I've got to read the, I've written it down, the actual verse. So uh, look up in your own time where it's found. <laughs> but um, this is the verse I, I had in mind. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Um, I think that just really sums up how much David thirsted and hungered for God. I was reflecting on this idea of thirst. That's a, a theme in this, this verse. And I think if anyone knew what, what true thirst was, it would be David, someone living in Palestine in that, in that area. It's not like us living in the suburbs and cities of Australia. You know, we, yeah, we, think, we, know, we think we know thirst maybe because we're like, we've gone for an hour run or played some basketball and hot sun for maybe like a 30 minutes or an hour and we get thirsty and we get a drink of water. But like David, he, he knew what it was like to thirst. And also too, especially we consider how he spent a lot of his time in the wilderness on the run. He probably wasn't near uh, wells and uh, maybe creeks for who knows how long. It probably would have been hard for him to find water. And 
I think, okay, so when David talks about this thirst, he is like describing a thirst that we, uh, I don't think really can comprehend. And that's the kind of thirst that he has for God, to know God and to be closer to God. And I think that's, that's pretty powerful. Mm. There's, a, there's a quote by this author that I like. I would recommend the book. It's called The Pursuit of God. Um, it's by this guy called A.W. Tozer. And I'll just read it out for you guys if that's okay. I think it uh, gets across, yeah, what David and people like that would have been feeling in the Old Testament as well. It says this, Come near to the holy men and women of the past, and you will soon feel the heat of their desire after God. They mourned for him. They prayed and wrestled and sought for him day and night, in season and out. And when they had found him, the finding was all the sweeter for the long seeking. Mm. I thought, yeah, I think that really sums up pretty good mm. uh, their, their search and their heart to know God more. Um, so, yeah, I look at David and... I I look at myself and I say, you know what, David really inspires me to be a better seeker of God. Mm. And I was thinking about this too. And I think in a a way it's like a search that never stops. You you keep, I think you continually keep seeking God and that's not because he can't be found, but I think that's because you just keep finding him. You keep finding out about his love and his goodness and his, and his grace. And you just want to, keep out seeking who he is so i think it's a never-ending search really that the journey of a christian it's a never-ending search to find god again and again and again and i think that's what i see in david's life um and of course like you hear all that and you think man this guy this guy must have been great what is what is spiritual spiritually minded wise awesome king and he thought no this guy how could this guy ever do anything wrong in his life? How could this guy ever stuff up? But of course, if you read the story, um, unfortunately, that's not the case. <laughs> that's not the case at all. Um, I think we tend to romanticize some of the Old Testament characters sometimes. We, I think we tend to overlook a lot of their flaws. We see them as these great spiritual heroes, and in many respects they are, but they're definitely not perfect. Um, mm-hmm. So... <clears throat> And David is no exception. He is, he's definitely far from perfect. There, I'll list some moments briefly, and then I'll get into a specific moment. I'm sure uh, you guys probably know where I'm going with this. But um, for a few examples before I get there. One example is David um, lacked faith at times in his life as well. For example, during that wilderness period when he was on the run, uh, a lot of the time he was taking refuge where God wanted him to be take, take refuge in the mountains and the wilderness. But there was a time when David got scared and actually started to live with the Philistines and was, uh, yeah, living with the enemies of God. And he, he was actually kind of deceptive as well. He sort of made it out that he was on the side of the Philistines and he sort of turned against Israel in a sense, but really, obviously he hadn't. And so, yeah, that was a bit of a lapse in David's life. David's life, he took multiple wives, which surprisingly caused him a lot of stress. <laughs> you you wouldn't think, hey, but uh, no, that, <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like that's what I love about the Old Testament. It doesn't it doesn't say that taking multiple wives is wrong, but if you read the story, you realize that every person who had two or more wives had an absolutely terrible time, and it's <laughs> <laughs> it's God trying to get that message across. <laughs> um, and, and David, unfortunately, suffered many family troubles. He was probably not the best father, father quite indulgent with his, with his kids. So, yeah, he's not a perfect man. But um, the, the crux of David's greatest fall is the Bathsheba incident. Um, yeah, so this is a big one. So fasten your seatbelts. Um, it's found in 1 Samuel chapter 11. Um, I won't go through the whole chapter, but I... I would recommend you go through it at home. But just to give you a brief uh, snapshot of what happened. um, Yeah, actually, I'll start off with the first verse. Um, Chris, do you mind maybe reading the first verse of chapter 11? So could you go to 1 Samuel chapter 11? Just read the first verse. No problem. 1 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 1 says, Then Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged besieged Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, make a treaty with us and we will serve you. 
Oh, sorry. Second Samuel. You're, second Samuel. Oh, is right? it, oh, sorry. Yeah. Did I say first? My bad. Yeah. Second Samuel. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Oh, good. Like, man, I don't remember Nahash the Ammonite in this story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Second Samuel 11 1 says, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites. Ooh, they came back. And besieged Jabbar. But David remained at Jerusalem. Yeah, I've always found this somewhat kind of funny. Um, I'll give the Jesse paraphrase here. In the spring, at the time when kings go off the wall, David sent Joab and stayed at home. That's... That's basically what that's basically what it's saying. Yeah. <laughs> you know, during this time, all the kings they go off to war with their men, they fight. And David had, had done this multiple times throughout these past, but not this time he stayed at home. And I always thought it's yeah, that's sad, but it's it's kind of funny. <clears throat> it's funny because it's it's funny because it's sad. Um so yeah, David stays home when he should be out with his men, and the problems just keep getting worse from here. Uh he is walking at home. Uh, one night and he sees this beautiful woman bathing he's like oh okay I, I like this girl and so he calls her over and he commits adultery with her and she tells him a bit later that she's pregnant the the problem is yeah yeah obviously this woman is married uh and he's got a problem because yeah he's got a child with a woman that's not his wife and he's a king like this is not a good thing and so you know the responsible thing at this point would be to to you know step up and be the man and say you know what? i've done wrong i've sinned tell the husband and face the consequences but no david keeps going down so not only does he if i can just interrupt yeah, as well go yeah the husband of bathsheba is one of those men who are out at the war yes so he hasn't been around for however long. So as soon as she gets pregnant, everyone knows it's not from her husband because her husband's out on the battlefield. Yes. So David's getting caught in now like this illegitimate child scandal as well. It's not just that the lady has a woman, uh, the woman has a child, but that this is an illegitimate child, not from her, uh, her husband. And everyone will know for a fact it isn't. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks for bringing it up, Chris, because that goes straight into what David does next, which yeah. is really oh, it's so bad. Um, so he recognizes this problem. He's like, OK, this this is not good. So he sends for the guy whose name's Uriah uh, to come back uh, under the guise of giving a report of how the war's going, you know, just to, you know, just to check up. But really, he's sort of hoping that, OK, he's going to come home. He's probably going to stay at home. That, that seems reasonable, right? And he's probably going to sleep with his wife. And then it'll look like that it's not my kid, that it's his. And he's like, okay, that, that seems like a reasonable plan. So that goes on. But the, the funny thing is that Uriah is such a noble character that he's like, you know what? How can I be sleeping in the bed with my wife when my mates are out there fighting a <laughs> war, sleeping in tents, on the dirt? He's like, I can't do that to my brothers. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> David's plan goes absolutely flop. <laughs> and do uh, you think that would be a sign that David was doing the wrong thing and he would wake up at this point? But no, he keeps going. He keeps going further. And so he says, okay, what? Well, I'll get Uriah drunk. And maybe if I get him drunk, that he'll, he'll sleep with his wife. But he still doesn't sleep with his wife. And David just cannot succeed. This, this guy Uriah is really, in many ways, proving himself to be way better than David at this point. Um, anyway, so David eventually comes up with a plan. He gives Uriah a letter uh, addressed to Job, who's the general of the, the army at the time. And he gets Uriah to basically uh, walk back with his death sentence in his hand back to the general Job. And basically it was a command saying, put Uriah to the front of the lines where it's most dangerous so that he will be killed in battle it will look like an accident and then it, it yeah then i can marry uh this woman and then then it looks like that's it's fine it's legit i've married a widow which is fine and then then it's just my kid and it, it kind of looks like david gets away with it but if you read the story you find out he doesn't and he repents 
but you yeah. look at this list of things that he did and I've got a list here. Okay. So number one, he covets a man's wife. He commits adultery with a man's wife. He then murders the man. In a sense, he kind of steals a man's wife and then he lies to cover it up. That's half the 10 commandments <laughs> in one swoop. <laughs> that's, ha- that's half the 10 commandments in one swoop. And you're like, Oh, David, this is coming from the guy who wrote, uh, these beautiful Psalms, maybe Michael, could you look up Psalm, the first Psalm, Psalm one and read verse one through to two. Sure. Thanks. And uh, Chris, could you maybe look at, look up Psalm chapter 40 and verse eight? No worries. Thanks. So Psalm chapter one, verses one to two says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Thanks. Yeah, and Chris, if you could read yours, thanks. Yeah, Psalm 40, verse 8. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Like, man, David, the the man who could write this and mean it and and live it, how Mm. in the world could he just fall so quickly break half the 10 commandments and one basically one giant swoop and you're like oh what in the world how do i make sense of this a man after god's own heart god calls him this and you think okay what in the world how could this be a man after god's own heart and it yeah it gets you thinking and you're like wonder how could he go from that that deep deep passion to knowing god following god's law loving god's law to this and from this I take a few different lessons and I'll, I'll quickly go through those lessons. Now, I think firstly, I take from this as a warning that, you know, even the best of us fall. Um, no person is exempt from committing even the most unthinkable wrongs. And I think that's something that we forget about these days. I think David is arguably one of the best of humanity, at least best in the old Testament and just look how he fell. I think we need to be careful not to become off guard or think that just because we live in a modern country like Australia with a Christian heritage, uh, an advanced civilization that we are exempt from committing these terrible, terrible evils. It actually, I heard this story once um, and I'll share it with you guys, Franklin D. Roosevelt. He was one of the presidents during World War II. And this also applies to the other Western leaders during this time when they first heard about the Holocaust and the things that the the Germans were doing, they actually had trouble believing, believing it. They just, they couldn't comprehend that this was actually happening. And their reasoning for this was because they couldn't think that an advanced Western civilization like Germany, uh, this is the same journey that gave us beautiful music through Bach and Mozart, the same Germany that gave us Martin Luther, um, (laughs) was the same journey that Germany that was doing these atrocities, uh, the Holocaust that killed 6 million Jews. They just, they couldn't comprehend that, that this was possible. They thought, okay, yeah, maybe an uncivilized tribe in the Amazon might uh, commit these atrocities, but like, nah, not Western civilization, not us. We're too advanced for that. But I think it's, it's uh, a scary warning that, um, yeah, we are capable of doing some pretty bad things. And I think we in society have forgotten Jeremiah 17, nine, which, uh, which says the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Like it's bad and we can't see that it's bad. And that's, that's something that we need to recognize. I think a little bit more that, um, and I think having this awareness actually helps us to, to not make the same mistakes as David to not fall into sin. And I think it, it makes us realize how much we need the grace of God in our lives and his strength from day to day to resist temptation. Um, because I think the moment that we think we are above committing these terrible things like David, they think, Oh, I'm a Christian. I, I could never do what David did. But then you have to think, okay, you know what? I, maybe that's not true. Maybe I am. Maybe I have the possibility or the, the seed within me to do these bad things. And, you got to keep that in mind and trust in God's grace and strength uh, to get you through. So 
Uh, it's not all bad though. <laughs> My second lesson has a little bit more hope to it. Um, I think because of David's great, great sin, it shows the grace of God to an even greater extent. The grace of God shines through even more because of the enormity of David's sin. And I think, you know, what, if God uh, could forgive David after what he did, then when I fail and when I, when I fall, God can for sure forgive me as well. And in that sense, this story, while it gives me a warning that maybe I'm not above doing these terrible things, that if I do fall and if I do fail, there is a gracious and forgiving God who is there with arms open wide to forgive me and to take me back when I do those things. And when I see David's repentance and how he turned back to God and God accepted that repentance, there were consequences for his actions for sure. Um, and if you read the story, you'll find those out, but God forgave him. And in that, I find tremendous hope and comfort. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's sort of why I, I like David so much in summary, his heart and his passion for God. Um, and the lessons of warnings I can take from his failures and mistakes, but also the comfort I get from knowing that God still forgave David, even after all that. And the fact that he's called a man after God's own heart in the New Testament kind of proves to me that, you know what, even after that sin, God still regarded this, this man as a man, after his, a man after his own heart. And I found incredible comfort in that as well. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's David. Awesome. That's awesome. That is like a perfect summary of the, mm. the life and character of David there. So look, um, before we wrap things up, Michael and Jesse, do you have any recommended readings for people if they want to learn more about your characters that you've chosen today? Um, sure. Well, I think the Bible is a good place to start if you want to learn more about Jesus. Um, It'll help. Another, yeah. another um, there, there, um, there, there's two actually. Uh, one is called... Jesus through Middle Eastern eyes. It's a really, it's a really good book. My friend's reading it at the moment. It's a book by Kenneth E. Bailey. I recommend checking that out. It gives you a bit of a cultural perspective of um, how others view Jesus. Um, and, and I think the best book other than the Bible that I can recommend is a book called The Desire of Ages um, by Ellen White. An awesome Bible commentary of the life of Jesus. Really, really good read. Awesome. Yeah, um, I've got a few books. If yeah, obviously the Bible once again. <laughs> um, more specifically, First and Second Samuel is where you'll find the majority of King David's story. But it also creeps over into First Kings as well. Uh, the first two chapters, I believe, of Kings, First Kings, you get to hear the uh, the end of David's reign and life. Um, but some other books outside the Bible, Patriarchs and Prophets, once again by Ellen White. Ellen White. Uh, at the end, there's quite a few chapters devoted to David that are really good. This other book called uh, David, A Man of Passion and Destiny by uh, Charles Swindoll. That's also very good. Um, and yeah, the book I mentioned earlier, The Pursuit of God by uh, A.W. Tozer. That's also a good read. Um, and while it's not specifically about David, I think it it's sort of, I, I guess, yeah, articulates his search for God and his seeking after God in a way that I found appealing. So, yeah. Perfect. Well, look, everyone, you know where to find all of us. You can find Jesse Marks and Michael Godfrey on their YouTube channels right under mm -hmm. those names. Look for me at Christopher Peterson, still waiting on Mitchell to catch up with the times over there and <laughs> get that YouTube account going. But um, apart from that, you can catch us here as well on our podcast. Um, every month we pump out one of these and you can also cat, uh, see all of us have written for the mighty warrior ministries website where you can uh, read articles about our different thoughts on lots of different topics. Um, and yeah, just be able to interact with us a bit more there. So check us out there, check out the podcast on SoundCloud, YouTube, anywhere you can find your podcasts and yeah, you'll inevitably stumble onto us somewhere. Well, look, thanks uh, everyone for joining uh yeah for this really awesome uh i think closing of the trilogy that we had i think um it was really good being able to hear all these different perspectives from everyone 
about who our favorite characters were and why and really delving into those number one picks, I think has been a really beneficial, um, yeah, beneficial little exercise that we've done together. So look, everyone, we'll catch you next month. And until then, have a good one and good night. Good night. Good night.